Have you ever seen something so beautiful? Is it actually going to hit you as well? That you know, there's a lot of factors that determine that. What's the hostile aircraft doing? And is there a mountain in the way? Blah blah blah. Hello, valued viewers. I hope you're all doing very well. It's July 2024, and a really important time for U.S. aviation military history. The U.S. have just pressed into service their first super long-range air-to-air missile. That is a missile that can achieve an air-to-air -air kill of over 200 miles. The missile is, of course, the air-launched version of the existing SM-6, known as the AIM-174B. And this means for the first time that both the US and China have super long-range air-to-air missiles. China have their existing in-service PL-17. And so what are we going to do? We're going to fight them against each other. The US will be using F-15EX with the AIM-174B and the Chinese will be using their J-15B with their PL-17. At this point, viewers, if you want, you can just skip to the action and use the chapters in the video. But for me, as a nerd, the really interesting part of this video is the details and looking at how we've set the aerodynamics up. So I'd really appreciate it if you stuck for the boring talky bit at the beginning for this one. Setting these missiles up in our sim was not easy, mainly because not much is known about the missiles. Most of it is classified and only the most basic information is known, especially the Chinese missile. So we've had to make quite a few assumptions, but to be honest we have to do that with almost all of our modern weapons. So let's look at some basic statistics. The AIM-174B in air-to-air -air configuration, and I should say that this is a multi-mission missile. It can be used for air-to-air -air and also air-to-ground, anti-shipping, in fact just about everything to be honest. Very basic statistics, its maximum achievable speed that we'll see today is between Mach 4 and Mach 6. That's 4 to 6 times the speed of sound, depending on the firing speed. So if it was fired stationary, it would peak at Mach 4. If it was fired at Mach 2, then it would achieve Mach 6. So that's what you're going to see today. And both missiles achieve the same peak speed. Range. Well, this is an interesting one, viewers. Both of them have 200 plus miles range. This is the first time we've dealt with missiles in our sim when they don't really have a maximum range. All the other missiles we've got, they have a maximum set range. And you cannot fire the missile beyond that range. These are very different. The way they work gives them a huge range. And for the first time in our sim, the maximum fireable range of these missiles is not dictated by the kinematic ability of the missile, but instead the sensor that guides it. It's a really weird conundrum to be in. The sensors on the firing aircraft are going to have a maximum range of around 100 miles. And the missile obviously needs to be initially guided by that sensor. So in this case, these missiles are going to be guided via off-board sensors known as AWACS with a much more powerful radar. These AWACS have a maximum detection range against a fighter-sized target of about 300 miles. Now we have to remember that the AWACS is going to be further back from the firing aircraft. In this case, I've set it at 100 miles. So what we're going to see is a maximum effective detection range of 200 miles. And that is what was going to set the maximum range of the missiles today, the detection range of an equivalent 200 miles. And I'll go through the details of that in a minute. Next is the impact speed. This is quite interesting. So the impact speed at 200 miles, which is going to be the firing range today, based on what I just said. Mark II for the 174 and Mark 1.8 for the PL-17. However, take that with a massive pinch of salt. All that is, is I've run the test through a few times and that's kind of the average mark that I've seen. But those speeds aren't really comparable because these missiles work really differently, which leads us into our most interesting part, which is the peak altitude. So again, assuming that the missile is going to be fired at 200 miles, what is the peak altitude? It's going to be 90,000 feet for the AIM-174 and it's going to be 120,000 feet for the PL-17. Why have we done what that? Well, let me bring in my first bit of information. As you see here, this extremely professionally prepared diagram is going to show how we achieve the optimum flight path for the missiles based on the 200 miles. The blue is the AIM-174, I may just call it SM-6 for the rest of the video for ease, and the red is the PL-17. Now, bearing in mind that these missiles have to be modelled to achieve real-life aerodynamics, or as close as we can get to them. What we don't want to do is make them cheat aerodynamics. We want them to comply with aerodynamics as best we can. So, bearing in mind basic information that we do know about the missiles, let's say the weight of the missile we know, we know the diameter, we know the length, we know the fin size, all this stuff is going to be modelled in terms of drag and stuff like that. 
the optimum flight profile, or I like to call it a parabola because it kind of is a parabola, is going to be a peak of 90,000 feet for the SM6 and a peak of 120,000 feet for the PL17. I describe it as a parabola because to get these massive ranges, you have to fire these missiles a bit like an artillery shell. You can't just fire it straight. It won't have the kinematic properties to do that. You have to lob it up at a high angle, get it into the thin air, and then let it slowly re-enter and hit on top of the target. So the PL-17 is fired from here and lobs on that guy there. The SM-6 is fired from here and lobs on that guy there. So why is the SM-6 lower? Well, that's because due to our calculations and, let's face it, lots of assumptions, although the SM-6 is a lot heavier missile, it also has much more rocket impulse, the amount of thrust coming out the back, and the duration of impulse, the amount of time it can run its motor for. That means that it essentially has superior on-power characteristics, which means that to achieve 200 miles and achieve its best impact speed, which is what we're trying to achieve, that's the killability of the missile, it only needs to reach 90,000 feet. We can make it go higher, we can make it go to 300,000 feet. You've probably seen a video where we've done that to achieve the 300 mile shot, but its killability starts reducing at that point. The PL-17 is a smaller missile and it's lighter, but it does not have as much impulse and its rockets will not last as long. So based on our assumptions, to get the maximum killability, we're going to have to fire the PL-17 a lot higher, higher parabola, just a different way of doing it to get its optimum terminal characteristics. So in summary, what you're going to see is an SM6 that's going to manage its kinematics a little easier today because of the amount of thrust and power it's got. It can go just up to 90,000 feet. You're going to see a very different approach with the PL-17. The PL-17 is going to have a slower climb up here, but what it's going to do is retain its energy better because it's gone higher, and then it's going to start speeding up and dropping down. So very different ways of doing things. Now, I thought at this point, as we're doing nerdery today, and again, you can skip this if you want. Most of you won't be interested. I thought you might want to look at what we have to do to set these missiles up. I should credit at this point dark helps ch helps and to be honest anyone else that's code is jungled up in here all of our gr specific mods we don't share and that's because well one of the reasons is it's full of other people's stuff it's full of grinelli stuff it's full of vsn stuff we just steal bits here and there and we can do that because we don't share it that's okay so purely out of interest this is the main file for the gr sm6 known as the aim 174b you set some basic local parameters up here viewers that's just stuff that will be used within this file then we make our main declaration we do some boring stuff there then we do some our first interesting stuff these are our base parameters and you can see them explained here exactly what they do or should i say the best assumption of what they do there's some moderately interesting stuff there then we come to the engine model data here uh, there are 58 parameters in here and this describes how engines are going to react with the atmosphere at different speeds and whatnot we then come to the wes data here this describes when ai and human aircraft will be in weapons engagement zone at different aspects and vectors. The controller tells us which engine uh, is on uh, at what point. Uh, we've got some basic electronic warfare here, although it's extremely basic. Uh, our inertial nav system here, uh, just very basic information. Um, my favorite bit, if you like messing with missiles, you can just mess around with the rocket motors and give it a Saturn V rocket motor if you want. All modern missiles have what are called twin pulse rocket motors viewers. In fact, not all. The Meteor doesn't. Um, but they stay the vast majority. It's just the best way of getting a missile uh, to the target, the cheapest way of doing it. So that is the first part of the rocket motor is the highest impulse, the highest amount of power or thrust if you like, and that forces the missile up to its maximum speed, up to high altitude into the thin air pressure. That then stops and then it switches to its sustainer motor, which fires at a lower impulse, a lower amount of power, but for a longer time. That's the best way to get a long range, and that's how all these modern missiles that are coming out now with their massive ranges work and operate such long distances. So you've got a declaration for the boost here, and you can mess around with that. You can change your impulse, the amount of fuel mass you've got, and all the other uh, interesting stuff. The march in DCS is describing the uh, sustainer motor, which will fire, based on the controller, uh, a certain amount of time after the boost. Then you've got the most interesting bit. It's the FM. It's the flight model viewers. The way this works, very generally speaking, is a drag matrix. You've got a drag matrix here, and it describes the different mark values here, uh, the speed of the missile at a certain speed. What do you want the drag of the missile to do? And here are the parameters. It's all very complex. And this is why it takes so long to mess with these missiles, viewers, and put so much work. Because you can change one value, then you have to spend 10 minutes starting up the game and trying it out. And then you come back and then you change another value. And, you know, it's just, it's just anyone who know, makes mods will know how long this takes. 
Uh, getting to the Enviewers sensor, of course, is the sensor on board uh, the uh, missile. None of these sensors are as impressive or as complex as real-life sensors. They're all simplified, but that's just how it has to be. Um, and to be honest, uh, it's all kind of BS anyway, viewers, because we just don't know the technicalities or the details of the sensors of these missiles. They're all classified. So what we tend to do, to be honest, is we just give all our missiles the same sensor unless we specifically know something. So the sensors, to be honest, are not very accurate accurately modeled but that's just how it is that's life that's the best we can do gimbal i've never fully understood but i've always assumed it is the travel threshold of the sensor you know you can swivel it at certain angles and stuff like that the autopilot uh, describes the main flight of our missile how, you know when we're talking about the parabola how is it going to actually form that parabola or flight path maybe is a better word actuator describes how the fins are going to react um you know each fin is going to twist a bit and that's what makes the missile turn proximity uh, the fuse uh, the distance away from the aircraft that will set the fuse off you can change that as well as the arming delay uh, how long the missile is fired before it arms warhead is quite complex and so we've uh, put that out to an external function somewhere else um, shape data, what does it look like, uh, where's the 3D model, and then you've got a bunch of in-game declarations, you just declare how the missile is going to actually be added to the game, and that is how a missile is made, viewers. Um, although it's not hugely uh, complex, it's only 456 lines for the SM6, you can start to see how much time in the background has to go in to making these missiles. Anyway, I apologise for boring you. I know that is extremely boring, and I've just spotted an error. I put an accidental AMAX in there. Let me just get rid of that. Uh, let's get to the fighting viewers. So, uh, we'll do a 1v1, just to explain how the missiles work in the air, and then we'll do a group v group. Uh, the way I've set it up is very simple. You've got uh, an aircraft here and an aircraft there. This aircraft is an F-15EX with... I had to put it with what I thought would be real realistic. I just don't think you're going to see F-15EX. A lot of you said, oh, put an F-15EX and put 18 SM6s on. I just don't think you're going to see that. I don't think that's tactically beneficial. And you've also got to think, look at the size of that missile. Look at the weight of that missile. The stress it's putting on that aircraft. The drag that's going to create. I just don't think it's efficient to load this thing up with lots of missiles. So the way I personally think it's going to be used is you're going to have a, a shooter aircraft like this. Ahead of it will be a Raptor or more likely an F-35 and that will be your radar. Um, this will probably have, I think, two SM6, AIM-174, and then I've given it four AMRAMs, the D3 variant with a range of 110 miles, and then a couple of uh, self-defense sidewinders. Just that guy there starting, a uh, supersonic 600 plus knots. He starts over 200 miles away from his uh, foe, which is going to be the J-15B. Um, he's going to have, well, essentially the equivalent. Um, it's going to have PL-17 there, their long-range variant. It, note it's quite a bit smaller than the SM-6, and that starts to describe, as well as the fins. Look at the fins. It's not quite as maneuverable in the terminal phase as the SM-6, and we've described that as well as best we can in the parameters of how we've set it up, viewers. Uh, the equivalent AMRAM is going to be these guys, the PL-15 range, 120 miles in self-defense PL-15 there. Uh, in terms of the maneuverability of the aircraft and the power of the aircraft, uh, the flanker is a little bit more maneuverable in the F-15. The F-15 is a bit more powerful. They will travel towards each other and fly at their maximum range. As I described earlier, the maximum range is not determined by the missile or the sensor on board the aircraft. It's actually determined, and I've shown here the 200 miles that they're almost certainly going to fire at, by the AWACS. And each has got identical AWACS either side viewers, because I don't want to bias either side. So if I measure here from the AWACS, this is the guy that's going to be detecting for the shot, to the guy... In fact, that point, I put a point there where I think it's going to shoot, where I know it's going to shoot. At 260 nautical miles, that says, viewers, which equates to 300 statute miles, and I'm working in statute miles today. That's the 300-mile point where the AWACS detects that aircraft there, and then because there's no real delay in DCS, that automatically goes through to this F-15. The F-15 will fire its missile, and vice versa. In real life, AWACS won't guide these missiles in. It will be the 5th gen radars, but we still don't have that working uh, viewers. So for the time being, AWACS are going to be guiding these missiles in. It's important to say at this point that DCS is not made for this. We abuse it massively to get these missiles to work. But it's cool that it allows us a back-end entry giggity, um, to kind of come and do this stuff. And it pretty much works, as you're about to see, to be honest. Right, off they go. We've got the J-15, 36,000 feet, burning towards the bad guy. He kind of knows that that hostile is there, but again, he can't fire the missile until that AWACS gives him the permission to fire that missile. So we shall wait, set up the map there, look at the F-15, also supersonic. It's going to go up to about Mark 1.5. Most both aircraft have been up, so they'll both be shooting at the same speed, which will give each missile a maximum speed today of about Mark 5.5. 
And we have a shot. Oof! Off the rail goes the massive 174. I've set the cost of 174 to the same as the SM6, and I've had to guess the cost of the PL17. And he goes defensive. Right, here we go, viewers. Now, the thing about this warfare is it's new to us. Super long range is new to us. We've I don't think we've ever had a battle like this before. The times take so long. These are not magic missiles. They will go at normal speeds. Uh, that you see 3,000 knots there. Now, look at this. Oh, so much to talk about. Uh, it got to its maximum speed there, about Mark 5, Mark 5.5. Now, look at the... It had to go vertically up. So, the plane is down there. The only way for me to get this missile 200 miles was to send it up. Look at the altitude at the bottom. 115,000 feet. 2,900 knots. It's got that massive parabola. It's a bit steeper than the parabola that I drew in the um, that simple diagram. And that's just because I was using Microsoft Paint or whatever. So it's gone almost vertically up. And now it's using the remaining energy. 126,000 feet. It's decided, look, did you see its controller kicked in there? And it's decided I actually need to go higher to make the shot based on what the F-15 is doing. So it's now gone to 130,000 feet. It's the highest I've seen it so far. And remember, there's almost no drag up here. Um, and it's actually riding quite a high angle of attack. So it's actually moving directly forward. It's actually slightly down, I think, now. Yep, it's on its way down. Right, let's have a look at the SM6. The SM6, in fact, we can see the difference in speeds here. There's no difference in speeds. It's a different. Remember, the PL-17 had to go higher parabola. So it has to go further. So it hasn't reached bullseye as quickly as the SM6 done. Here is the SM6. The SM6 is just going to work differently. Uh, 3,400 knots, and it never went as high. It's now down to 75,000 feet, and it would have peaked about 90,000 feet, maybe 85,000 feet. It's going to have a much flatter trajectory now. It's now going to use its um, weight, strangely, its weight, to plummet down through the atmosphere, 70,000 feet. We'll look at the distances now. We are now three minutes into the sim. PL-17 is 2,600, 2,700 knots, and it's now diving down from 105,000 feet. Now, this missile, well, the SM6 now is going to slow down. This missile is actually going to start speeding up. You can see it's speed down the bottom, it's speeding up, because it's basically dropping through 100,000 feet, where there's almost no air resistance, onto the target. I mean, this is how long these things happen. It's now 3 minutes and 30 seconds. Now, in real life, the aircraft could turn around and run home because the AWACS are guiding these missiles in, but AI just isn't that smart, and that's fine. SM6 now dropping down 25 miles away from its target, but the PL-17 is still... 46 miles away from its target. But, like I said, SM6 is going to slow down now. PL-17, because it's coming much steeper down, is actually going to speed up. So both are going to have about the same impact velocity. J-17, J oh, too much happening now. Yeah, this guy's going defensive. Probably the missile's gone terminal. Have a look at the missile. 2,000 knots now. Mark 3. Uh, quick look at the scenery, viewers. My favourite map. Beautiful, beautiful scenery. Look at that. Have you ever seen something so beautiful? Is it actually going to hit viewers? Well, that... You know, there's a lot of factors that determine that. What's the hostile aircraft doing? And is there a mountain in the way? Blah, blah, blah. And let's just pause that. Oh, balls! I just missed it. I think it was 1,400 knots or just below 1,400 knots. That's all there, viewers. Which is now on about Mark II at uh, sea level. So, a Mark II impact pretty much as we thought. I'm pause. Massive warhead on that thing. So, it would atomize. It doesn't even need to get near it. It can uh, detonate quite far away. Now, here's this one. Pause. Uh, so look how steep this one's been coming down. And it's maintained 1,800 knots now, viewers. And it may even have a higher impact speed. Remember, the flight path and the parabola it's done depended on what the hostile was doing. And the hostile will do different things each time. So it's probably had to do something differently than it would normally do. 1,700 knots. The speed it achieves is depending on how much it has to turn on the way down. Because it's not being powered, it's just got gravity. So if the hostile plane made it turn a lot... Oh, I think it's just lost track. Ha, huh, how about that, viewers? It happens sometimes. Will it lose track? As I said, they've got the same sensors on both missiles because we don't know about the, the real-life sensors. And even if we did, we probably couldn't model them that realistically, to be honest. So whether they hit or not is going to deter be determined by what the hostile aircraft did. And this aircraft did a thing that scrubbed a lot of speed off and essentially broke the lock, so, so be it. Now, we can probably run it again now, viewers. And see the opposite thing happened. I also noticed it was quite slow that time, so that's interesting. So the thing that the F-15 did, did well to scrub that speed off. All skill levels are set today, are the same viewers. What I'm going to do is now rerun it, and we'll see what happens next time. Okay, off we go. Now we have the ability to speed up time, so we don't have to spend five minutes doing it again, viewers. So I'm just going to punch time up. Missiles out, 200 miles, based on the sensor values that we've set. SM6 reaches the doodah slightly quicker, but the PL-17 now starts speeding up for the aerodynamic reasons I said. So look at this, the J-15 has done exactly the same thing it did last time, so it's going to get caught exactly the same way. 1,500 knots, 1,400 knots, 
exactly 1400 knots. Now, the F-15, is it doing something different? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, the F-15 is going to get caught this time. It just didn't do the thing that it did last time to beat the missile. Now, let's look at the impact speed. It's actually lower this time. And that's why I got Mach 1.8 um, as an average there. So just over 1200 knots instead of 1400 knots. So that is pretty much Mach 1.8. So that just seems to be bearing in mind the parabola we've got. The missile weight, sizes, the fins and whatnot. Boom. The SM-6 is a slightly better manoeuvring missile because of its larger surfaces as well, but I've not really seen that actually make any difference, viewers. Um, we'll keep running that, uh, viewers, and most of the time I get a double KO like I've got there. Sometimes the SM-6 misses, sometimes the PL-17 missiles misses. Like I said, it's not really the missile that misses, it's what the plane does, which makes this kind of hard to do scientifically. Um, that was fun, viewers, but why don't we do a group v group now? So that was 1v1. 1v1 is pretty easy to control, viewers. Uh, when it comes to group v group, it gets more difficult to control because the AI start interacting with each other in the group. And it's, well, you just have to see what happens. Uh, right, so let me just show the distances. Because they're going to be group v group, I've started them further out. And that's because they're going to want to arrange, arrange their formation. So nautical miles, 240. That's 280 statute miles. So a lot further than they were last time. Uh, right, it's going to be a few minutes before they fire as they arrange their battle formations. Speed advantage goes to F-15, maneuverability advantage goes to J-15. Interesting, the J-15 are going for line abreast, whereas the F-15 have staggered. You just never know what you're going to get. What is it that controls the way the different aircraft work? I would love to know that, viewers. I really don't know what it is. But, um, as I said, otherwise they're all set up identically. You just never know what's going to happen. When will they fire? Well, it's again, it's based on the AWACS. So whenever the AWACS is going to give them the OK to fire, basically. Just check the speeds purely out of interest. J-15's made 830 knots. F-15's made 900 knots. So just better accelerating, better, more modern engines in the F-15. And the drag values are more or less the same. Look at that. They really have gone line abreast. 900 knots, F-15 in a completely different formation, a thousand knots. Okay, missiles have come out from, amazingly, red first. They fired the missiles first, wow. And on defensive, here come the blue missiles. Red have fired three missiles, blue have fired two missiles. Again, what is it that controls that? I just don't know. This is whatever the AI decide to do, where they consider their threats, blah, blah, blah. Interesting that the only they have only fired two blue missiles, and again, I could rerun it and it'll probably change again. So, let's check this missiles in flight. The PL 17s have boosted themselves up to their massive altitude of 120,000 feet, well over 3,000 knots. The SM 6s appear to have been fired later. That's an interesting decision for the F 15s to do. I'm not sure I support that fully. These two guys are on defensive, presumably, those are the wow. Presumably those are the guys that have been that have fired their missiles. All aircraft have full internal fuel today, so there is enough fuel to go around the friggin' world in this battle. Now here's the next problem, viewers. Like I said, everything takes so long because the missiles are so slow. Well, not slow. That's two, 3,000 knots. It's Mark 5 or whatever, but you know what I mean. When you're going this far, everything just takes for ebbs. Wow, a new record, 135, did you see that, viewers, at the bottom? 135,000 feet, maybe even went up to 140,000 feet. And that's because the thing it was fired on is doing something that needs to make it do a new parabola. Now, strangely, only two SM6s fired, and these guys are just not firing, just not interested in firing. Probably due to a tactic that they're programmed to do or whatever, I don't know. That's, uh, that's all out of my hands, viewers, and don't get to control that. Right, the first missiles are coming in now. The SM6s are going to be slowing down. Wow, this one achieved really high speed. Look at that, 3,400 knots, Mark 5. I don't know how it got so fast, to be honest. It must have been based on, I don't know, some reason. Anyway, I've never seen an impact speed as high as that. Every day is a learning day, I suppose. Now, what are the PL-17s going to do? Well, they're fast as well. They're nearly 3,000 knots as well. So for some reason, I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you what happened. Why? It's because the aircraft did different things this time that allowed the missiles to be much faster. And I don't know. It's a bit beyond me at that point. So we're going to get some really high probability of kills here, viewers. Now, look at the F-15. The F-15 chose to outrun it, where the J-15 chose not to. But as powerful as an F-15 is, you can't evade that. Falling out of the atmosphere at those speeds. Two F-15s down. Oh, dear. What's this SM-6 going to do? It's down to Mark 2 and lower. Yeah, 
there. Two smash down. But there's a PL-17 dropping out the atmosphere as another uh, SM-6 is fired. Now, in reality, I personally think that these missiles will drop a lot steeper. I think they'll come right over and drop straight down. But like a lot of things in DCS, some things I just can't model. So mine are going to come down more at like a 30 degree angle. I think it's missed. It ha No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't, viewers. Well, it's the slowest battle in the world, but it's also kind of cool. I think it's kind of cool. 1,100 knots. 1,000 knots. Can he deet it? Oh, no, sir, sir, sir. He was so close to beating that. 1v2. Oh, no, and two pl 17s are out. Yeah, I can see which way this is going to go, viewers. Well, that's how it happens sometimes, I'm afraid. Again, we just sit and wait now and watch these thunder blasts smash. 188,000 feet! 200,000 feet. It's going to crash the server. It's going to crash the server. It's gone wrong, viewers. It's gone wrong. I suspect because the thing it was fired against is now dead and it's no longer guiding. So it's just gone. It's it's breaking the atmosphere. Look. It's now, it's now a space shuttle going into orbit. That's interesting. And at this point, you know, the physics probably breaks down completely. I, I wouldn't expect it to work, but it's interesting. Could, is that possible in real life? Well, why not? Remember, the in the 70s, the an F-15 fired an ASAT missile, which is essentially just one of these, but with a much more prehistoric rocket motor, and it, you know, it goes into space. So why can't this missile do that? 270,000 feet. Right, anyway, I have the ability to speed up now, and it's something you really have to do if you're going to watch this kind of battle, so I'm speeding up. No, I've got to know how high it went. It's now 297,000 feet and it's coming back down. Imagine if this hit someone at 297,000 feet. It's now on its way down. Another PL-17's out. Now, is this SM-6 going to do a thing? It's maintained brilliant legs. Oh, that's because it went too far. It went too far. Look, it missed its target. His autopilot failed. Yeah, why did it do that, viewers? It's based on the thing that this guy did, I suspect. It confused the missile. And now here's a really important point. Stop. Why are these missiles sometimes ineffective, viewers? Is because, remember, when they're up here, 89,000 feet, there's not really any air. They can't, these tiny little fins have no effect on the missile at that point. So remember the parabola, in its high state of the parabola, it can't actually steer. So at that point, if the thing it's fired against makes a move by a few miles away, that's it. By the time this re-enters the thicker air and it can steer, it's out of its kinematic ability to hit. So that's probably what happened to the SM6. This guy did a thing when this SM6 was so high it couldn't steer, and that's the end of it. It's, it's screwed at that point, you know. And then again, how well that's modeled in DCS, I don't know. But that's definitely a thing. We've noticed that even with our versions of the missiles. So they are easy to beat if you know they've been fired at you, which you probably wouldn't in real life. Boom, you fail. Oh, the other F15 just got hunted down by PL17s. Oh, boo viewers. Uh, so be it. Again. Alright, rematch. Punch it. Right, again, I can speed it up. Different tactics, look, viewers. This time, they've done that. This time, Blue have done that. What is it that makes them decide that each time? Missiles out. Oh, look at that. This time, Blue have fired three, and China have fired two. Again, what is it that makes them do that? I would love to know. Again, the Blue missiles get to bullseye first, but we'll lose their speed quicker, whereas the PL-17s will work a little differently. Right. What do we watch? This one there. Really fast impact. Not sure why. Hit. This guy here. Hit. This guy here. Can we get three and one before the PL-17s even reach? Now this one, look, this one's got much slower. Those ones will hit him like 2,000 800 knots. These one hitting a 1500 knots. I wish I knew what it was that decided that. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Smooshy bam bam. Three and three. What are the PL 17s doing? They're chasing the boys down. Uh, uh. Boom, F 15 down. It's guiding, it's guiding, but its speed is dropping. 1800 knots. 1700 knots. 1600 knots, 1500 knots, 1400 knots, 1300 knots. Is he turning hot or cold? And he's beaten it. He did a thing. Track limits, radar notching, I don't know, did something. Well done. There is one Chinese person uh, still going, and he's just launched a PL 17 into the atmosphere. Yeah, I can see who's going to win there. So this time it was the other way around, which is weird because it's an identical scenario, viewers. 
Yeah, nothing escapes this. Absolutely smash. Supreme victory for blue. Let's just check if this PL-17 is going to chase. And it's given up. All right. Let's do one more time, viewers. One more time. And you can start to see at this point that I can keep running it many times and it's going to have a different result each time. Now, why is that, viewers? I... I think it's to do, personally, I think it's all about what the target does while the missile is in the air. So if the target does something unexpected, the missile just goes dumb and misses altogether. If the target does something else, the missile becomes amazing, like some of these real fast SM6 missile hits. Anyway, uh, Blue's 5-3 again and China's 5-2. It seems that whoever wins is the guy that fires the most in the first salvo. Again, that's out of my control. That just is whatever they want to do. That kind of makes sense, right? The guy who fires the first missiles first. and In fact, it's basically going to be a carbon copy of what we just saw by the looks of it. Yeah. It is literally just what we just saw. No, it's not because the PL-17s are getting here first. So there is something different that's happening. Last time the PL-17s didn't get here as fast. Two and a half thousand knots. Smashy, smashy. Boom, boom. Is that guy going to get here? Look, it's still chasing him. This is where the weight of the missile actually helps. It's using its weight. Again, it'll probably drop down steeper in real life. But it's using its weight to speed it along. 1,500 knots. 1,400 knots. 1,300 knots. Smash. And finally, PL-17. 1,700 knots. 1,600 knots. Here's where the kinematic superiority of the F-15, I think, helps. I think they're so much faster accelerating that they can displace themselves from where the missile was initially fired quicker than the flankers can. And I think they're using it at their advantage. And it's just gone whatever has happened, you know? I don't really know what that is. Decided it couldn't make the intercept. 900 knots done. Well done, F-15s. Just see it through to the end. We know what's going to happen at this point. All oh, right, very good. At the end of that, who won? Well, in the particular ones that we run here, the F-15 won most, but... I, I get the feeling I could run that all day and it'll probably average out about 50-50 uh, as we've seen wins from both sides. I reckon the SM6 has got slightly better parameters. It just seems to handle itself better at the end there. It'll retain its energy better for whatever reason. Weight. I don't know. Some kind of reason. How is this going to be used in real life in air-to-air? -air? Well, presumably um, you'd have a, a F-35 50 miles away from the target being hidden. You'd have F-15EX here with a couple of uh, 174s 200 miles away and we'll just lob the missile guided by the F-35 onto whatever, a target of opportunity. These are very expensive missiles and, you know, you don't want a lot of these on the jet. So I don't think they're ever going to replace the AMRAAM. I think they're going to be for targets of opportunity, high value targets, obviously for air to ground as, as we saw there, but still hugely effective weapon. What they do is they nullify this weapon here, PL-17, and they've done that well. Uh, Russia has a similar type of weapon. It's a tactical, it's an area, de area denial weapon. It, it, you know, it stops things operating like airboxes, refuelers, stuff like that. Uh, let me know your thoughts, viewers. Let me know your thoughts. That's probably the best I can do with it. I hope you enjoyed that. And bye!